Before we kind of get, get going here, you know, uh, I've been thinking about, about dad jokes, you know, because I, I love dad jokes. I don't know, anybody like dad jokes? Couple, all, all the guys do, right? Um, you know, how many times, every single time as a kid, I stub my toe, my dad always, without fail, you want me to call the tow truck, you know? <laughs> or, or, or your kids, they like, I'm hungry. Hi, hungry. I'm dad, you know? Um, or, or, you know, you ask your dad, oh, you know, they, they see him get hurt. Are you all right? No, I'm not all right. I'm half left, you know? Or, um, or we, we're driving up. My dad, even to this day, sees train tracks. You know what? I can tell a train's just been by here. And somebody's always a sucker. And says, how can you tell? Because he left his tracks, right? <laughs> um, here's some other ones I found online. If attacked by a mob of clowns, always go for the juggler. Um, be careful standing near those trees. They look kind of shady. Uh, why can't you hear a pterodactyl going to the bathroom? Because the pee is silent. Uh, some of you are going to have to look that one up later. I was fired at the calendar factory. Apparently they didn't like it when you take days off. Um, I've been reading a book about anti-gravity. I can't put it down. Um, or or one, just yesterday, I was driving with my, my oldest daughter, Belle, and she's telling me about how many Grammy Awards her, you know, one of these artists, music artists has won. She said, oh, he's got all these Grammy Awards. I'm like, you have two Grammys, too. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, you're Nana and you're Mima. Come on, that's good stuff there. I, I came up with that all on my own. Yeah. Man, just get no love here. This is Father's Day, too. Come on. Um, anyhow, we're starting a brand new series uh, today called The Downfall. Man, it sounds like such an uplifting series, doesn't it? <laughs> the Downfall. I guess the, the subtitle could be The Downfall of Great Men. You know, all through the Bible, we see people, not just men, but men and women, that are painted a very real light. We see their strengths, we see their weaknesses. And all of them uh, are terribly flawed except one, except Jesus. And, and that's, that's a way that we can know that Jesus really did live a perfect and sin-free life. Because if he screwed up, the Bible would have said something about it. Because we see all kinds of things in the Bible. People that mess up time and time again. So we're going to be looking at a guy from the Bible and, and, and how he messed up. And um, so we're going to be looking at the story of, of Samson. He's the strongest man to have ever lived. And Scripture talks a lot about him. And he was a judge of Israel. Now, the thing we need to realize about Israel is Israel, the people of Israel, were living in an oppressive government at the time. The Philistines had come and taken over. They were very violent. They were very ungodly. They came and they took over, and so the Philistines were in charge. And, and these were the bad guys, and they had been ruling for 40 years. And God wanted to turn things around. He wanted to turn the tides on these Philistines. So, so there was a, a, a husband and a wife, and they couldn't have kids. And, and they were barren for whatever reason, and God came to them, and He gave them this promise in Judges chapter 13, verse 5. He says, you'll become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. So, he, this is a very, very frustrating character in the Bible. I mean, you read his story and it's very frustrating because here we see, even before he was born, he was called by God. There's not many people in the Bible that, that their birth was foretold and predicted and they were called by God even before they were born. And Samson is one of them. But yet we see that he messed up his life again and again and again. He was a Nazarite. Now don't get that confused. Some of you that, that have been around church a little bit, you know, Jesus was from Nazareth, and we see Nazareth, like, oh, that must be the same thing. It's not the same thing. Nazareth was the place. He was a Nazarite, and a Nazarite was a way that a normal person could say, you know what, I'm going to set myself apart from God. And there were certain rules that they had to live by in order to, to be set apart in this way. 
And you can read about that in number six. So, so these ordinary people could then set themselves apart. There was three basic rules, though, if you wanted to be a Nazarite. The first rule was that you couldn't drink wine. Couldn't drink wine. That was just one of the rules. Now, not only could you not drink wine, you couldn't drink grape juice. You couldn't eat grapes. You couldn't eat raisins. Nothing that had anything grape to do with it. So, so that was one of the rules. He couldn't have anything that had to do with grapes. The second thing was that, that he couldn't cut his hair. He wasn't uh, allowed to, to shave or cut his hair or do anything. He just had to, to grow naturally long. This is a way that the Nazarites, you could almost tell them apart. You're like, oh, he hasn't cut his hair in a long time. He must be a Nazarite or just really lazy, one or the other. And so, so Samson wasn't allowed to cut. The last thing is that he wasn't allowed to touch anything dead. So if he saw a dead body or a dead animal or whatever, he was not allowed to touch that. So, uh, so there was these three things. No, no wine, grapes, any of that stuff. Couldn't touch anything dead. Couldn't cut his hair. Some people are like, wow, that's great. You know, couldn't, I don't have to ever cut my hair again. In fact, there was a story I heard about a, a, a dad and his son. And his son had just gotten his driver's license. And the son's like, dad, you know what? I think it's time that we sit down and we talk about you know, possibly getting me a new car. And the dad's like, okay, well, here's what I want to see you do. I want to see you bring your grades up in school. I want to see you start reading your Bible more, and I want you to get a haircut. And then we'll talk about getting you a car. So, so uh, you know, several weeks, uh, a couple months maybe pass by, and the son comes to the dad and says, Dad, I think it's time that we talk about getting a car. And the dad says, well, I, you know, I see that you brought your grades up at school, and that's great. And, I, and I've seen you reading your Bible, and that's really good. But you know what? You haven't gotten your haircut yet. And the son says, well, you know, as I've been reading my Bible, I see that the Samson, he had long hair, and Moses had long hair, and, and Jesus had long hair. And the dad says, you know what, you're absolutely right. I think you should follow the example of these men. They walked everywhere they went. <laughs> so, another, another bad joke for you. But um, if you're taking notes, write this down. Samson was an incredibly strong man with an incredibly weak will. An incredibly strong man. He was the strongest man ever lived. Now, now a lot of people, when they picture Samson, they picture somebody that's like jacked. You know, it's got all these, you know, muscles on top of muscles. You know, you've seen people like that. It's like, you ask him like what time it is, and they're like, let me check. You know, oh, you know, it's, you know, whatever. And I don't picture Samson like that at all. I picture he was probably just a normal looking guy. Because I believe that his strength came from God and not just from the muscles that he had on his body. But, but we see that he was an incredibly strong man, but his will was incredibly weak. His whole life was filled with amazing miracles and these tragic mistakes. So we're going to look at three attitudes. Three attitudes that make strong men weak. Three attitudes that make strong men and women weak. The three attitudes are, are, are lust and pride and anger. The first one, lust. Lust can, can be summed up in this phrase, I want it. I want it. it, it it's a passionate and unhealthy desire for something. It, it becomes all-consuming. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a, a lust for for power or prestige. Maybe it's a sexual lust. Maybe it's a, a lust for things, a new car, a new boat, a new house. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a, a lust for, for, for a title or a promotion. Well, this is something that was part of Samson's downfall. Let's look together in Judges chapter 14, verse 1. He says, One day when Samson was in Timnah. Now, where is Timnah? It tells us. What? It, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. So he's in Timnah. Timnah's a part of the Philistine territory. So, now who was the Philistines again? They were the enemies. They were the bad guys. And here's Samson hanging out in Timnah. And he sees one of the Philistine women, and she caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye, and I want to marry her, get her for me. You know, I mean, he, he just goes, he sees this girl. Now, part of the problem was, the Philistines were marrying the Israelites, and as a result, the Israelites were beginning to worship the idols 
of the Philistines. So this was a problem. And so his father and mother in verse 3 objected. said, isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all of the Israelites you can marry, they asked? Why must you go after, go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told her father, get her for me. Why? Why? She looks good to me, right? I mean, it's like, okay, there, I mean, you're not even, you're not seeing, can, you know, can she cook? Is she a loving person? No, it's like, she looks good. I want her, you know? So go get her for me. So the dad, he goes and, uh, and he begins to, you know, arrange this marriage. Because, but see, Samson wasn't just acting on behalf of God. He was acting because of the lust that was in his life. This is something that has destroyed many men and many women. A lust after things, a lust after jobs, house, sex, inappropriate relationships, all of these things. And here we see Samson, who was so strong on the outside, but he had no control on the inside. So the first attitude that brings down strong men is lust. The second one is pride. And this can be summed up with this phrase, I can handle it. I can handle it. I'm strong. I can handle it. It's like, it's like, you know, we saw in the video, like the, the guy getting lost, right? Like, I'm, I, I can figure this out. I can handle it. That, that comes back to pride. I can handle this. We see Samson really was strong. In fact, one time when he's going to Timnah to visit his bride, he's going along and he gets attacked by a lion. Has anybody ever been attacked by a lion before? No? Okay. I don't know about you, but I don't think I would like to get attacked by a lion. I've never fought a lion before, not even a little one. But several years ago, we went to a zoo in New Jersey, and uh, my my oldest daughter, was she was just a baby at the time. And I've seen lions in zoos before. Maybe you have too. What are they usually doing? Like sleeping like under the shade. Well, we go, and this lion is not sleeping under the shade. He looks ticked off. And he's, I don't know, about 15, 20 feet away. And he's looking at us. Now, fortunately, there was a fence between us. And this lion roared. Now, I don't know if you ever heard a lion roaring before. I had never heard, I mean, I'd heard one like on TV, but I never actually heard a lion roaring at me before. And let me tell you, that fence looked awfully weak. (laughs) I, I don't know if I'm making this up or not, but it felt like to me that the ground was shaking. I mean, this thing was so loud and so rumbling, I was like, oh my, if I saw this thing in the wild, I, I would just, I would just fall over dead, I'm sure. I mean, this is horrible. This thing is so powerful. Well, anyhow, uh, Samson gets attacked by a lion. Scripture says that he kills the lion with his bare hands, just like he was killing a goat. Now, I've never killed a goat with my bare hands, and I can't imagine that being very easy. But he killed this lion just like that. So, so he kills this lion, and, and he goes on with his day. Like, oh, this is another. I just grab, snap the lion's neck, whatever. Anyhow, I don't know how long later, but he comes back by this area again and he sees the lion's carcass there. And guess what's inside the lion's carcass? A bunch of bees, honeybees, have come and built a a hive in there and, and there's honey inside the carcass of this lion. So Samson goes up and he scoops some of this. Now, isn't that gross? I mean, you're eating honey out of a dead animal. Now, what's one of the things he's never supposed to do? Touch a dead thing, right? So he goes, he takes it, he's eating this honey. In fact, he brings some to mom and dad, doesn't tell them it comes out of a lion's carcass, but he gives some to them, and he's like, wow, this is great, free honey in this dead animal's carcass. Well, anyhow, he's going along to his wedding, and and, and the father of the bride has given him 30 men to kind of be uh, be his groomsmen, I suppose, and, and Samson's like, I'm going to give you a riddle. And let's make this riddle interesting. Because that's what guys do. We like to make things interesting. You know, if we got a game, it, it's more fun when we start putting money on it, right? So, so, so Samson's like, I got a riddle. We're going to make this interesting. If, if, you can, if, I, if you can guess my riddle, I will provide a, a brand new set of clothes for each of you 30 guys. And 
You, and if you can't get the riddle, then each of you give me a set of clothes, so I'll get 30 pairs of clothes. Now, he wasn't really figuring this out, because that means each of those guys only had to provide one set of clothes. He had to provide 30. So here's the riddle in Judges 14, 14. He says, Out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Three days later, they were still trying to figure it out. So these groomsmen, they're pondering this. What in the world does he mean? They're pondering, if we don't get this right, we're going to have to give him a set of clothes. They're pondering this. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, listen to this, entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. Boy, that escalated quickly, didn't it? It's like, like okay, let's have a riddle. I mean, you know, don't... Don't play games with these guys. You know, you give us the answer to this riddle or we will kill you and your family. Did you invite us to this party just to make us poor? So, so Samson's wife pulls out the card that no guy can resist. You know, she plays that card. What, you know what it says? So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, you don't love me. You hate me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. He says, I haven't even given the answer to my father and mother. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting her with her, tormenting him with her nagging. I want to ask you if you've ever experienced that before. Um, <laughs> then what does she do? She goes and explains the riddle to the young men. Verse 18. So before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And here Samson replied. I love this line. It's horrible, but I love it. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. Don't take, don't ever quote this verse to anybody. Okay? Just a little bit of advice. Don't call your wife a heifer. <laughs> If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, if you look at this in the original language, what this really means is, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, um, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. So, he, he's starting to get angry, and that brings us to the third one. Anger. And, and this is, is summed up in the concept of, I've been wronged. I've been wronged. So Samson feels like he's been betrayed. He was furious. His anger got the best of him. And where is he going to get? 30 sets of clothing. He's got to pay up now. Well, I'll tell you where he gets 30 sets of clothing. He goes down to another village and he slaughters 30 men. And, and well, what do you got to do to take the clothes off? You got to touch the dead bodies. So here he is. Now, he, he's already been, he been, been drinking in his party. He's been, you know, now he's touching dead bodies. He pulls off these clothes, he goes, he delivers them to them, and then he just goes home because he's just so angry. Then, a little while later, I don't exactly know how long later, he comes back and he's like, hey, I want to see my wife. He goes to the father of the bride, I want to see my wife. And the dad's like, ah, you know, there's a problem. Your wife's not actually your wife. In fact, I gave your wife to the best man. Well, and Samson's like, well, you did what? He's like, well, we already had a wedding. You took off all angry. So I'm like, hey, I'm not going to waste this wedding. So I gave her to the best man, and so she's already married now. So now, what do you think happens to Samson? His anger begins to boil. He's even more angry. So he does that. He goes out. I don't know how he does this. The Bible says he catches 150 pair of fox. It's like 300 fox. I would have to see how this thing all played out. But somehow, he caught all these fox, he tied their tails together with a torch, lit the torches, and sent these foxes running through the Philistines' fields, totally destroying the fields and the, the orchards and the, the vineyards, destroying everything. The Philistines come, and they say, who did this? They say, Samson did. He was mad at his, you know, supposed to be his wife. Her dad gave him away. So then, guess what the Philistines do? They go and they light the house on fire with the lady and her dad in it and kill them after all. I mean, man, this is just escalating. All from, from a riddle. So now, 
<laughs> Samson hears about that. And guess what happens? He gets even more <laughs> angry. And he goes out there, and, and, and he just killed a bunch of people. We don't know how many people he killed, a bunch. And then he went and he hid in a cave. So now he's angry, he just kills people just because he's mad, and then he goes and he hides in a cave. And then the Philistines are like, this means war. So they bring their armies to Israel and say, we're about to wage war. They, they set siege around Israel. And the Israelites come out and say, why are you trying to make war with us? And they say, we'll tell you why. It's all about this riddle. And they tell the story. And, and so the Israelites are like, okay, here's what we'll do. We don't want any trouble with you. We'll get Samson and give him to you. Will that make you happy? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. So they go, 3,000 Israelites, 3,000 soldiers go, they get Samson, they tie him up with ropes, and they bring him to the Philistines, and the Philistines are cheering, they're so excited, they finally got this, this man who's caused them so much harm. And the Bible tells us that he snapped the ropes like they were charred cord. He snaps the ropes, he and he finds a jawbone of a donkey, which happened to also be dead. He gets his jawbone, and he begins to fight these Philistines. Scripture says that he killed a thousand people with that jawbone of a donkey. Listen to what it says after, in Judges 15, 16. I like how the NIV says it. Then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. You can, you can change those words around if you want to. I mean, this is an insult here. With his donkey's jawbone, I made a donkey out of you. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand men. And then through that, Samson kind of repented and kind of got his life back on track. And we don't really hear much about him for the next 20 years. He, he was a judge over Israel and, and probably did a pretty good job there. But... Later on, these things started to rise up again. And, and, and he's going through, 20 years later, he's in the Philistine area, and he sees a hooker. And he's like, ah, why don't I stop in for the night? So he stops in for the night, and while he's there, the people of Philist, uh, the Philistines, they see him go into this lady's house, and he's there doing whatever he's doing, and they camp out around. And they're like, when he comes out, we're going to get him and kill him. Well, anyhow, in the middle of the night, Samson came out, snuck by them, go out. They're in a city called Gaza. There's these gates, these doors on the gates. He rips the doors off of the city, and he puts them on his shoulder, and he carries them up to the top of this hill, and he throws them there. Now, people estimate these doors probably weighed about 700 pounds. Now, I don't know if that's a lot for you. That's not a lot for me. I mean, I, I bench press that all the time. But, but for Samson, I mean, he picked this up, hiked to the top of the hill, and put it on. Now, why was that significant? Man, the gate, that's what kept the bad guys out. This was not only destroying their property. This is an insult. It's like, I'm taking what's keeping you safe. I'm taking your security with me. And he goes with these gates. Shortly thereafter, though, he meets another lady whom we probably are more familiar with, Delilah. He meets her and he's, you know, wants to, to have a relationship with her, apparently. So he begins this relationship. And uh, the rulers of the Philistines come. There's five of them. They come to her with a proposition and say, you know, we know Samson's been coming here a lot. We will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. 5,500 pieces of silver. I don't know what that translates into now, but it's a lot of money. We'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver each if you find out the secret to Samson's strength. You find out the secret of that, and we'll give you all this money. So, so Delilah, she goes, and she begins to ask him, What's the secret of your strength? And he says, well, if you tie me up with seven bowstrings, I'll be as weak as any other man. So she's like, okay. So he goes to sleep. She ties him up with seven bowstrings. Wakes him up in the middle of the night. The Philistines are here. Samson, he jumps up and he snaps the bowstrings and he beats him up. Then she's upset with him. You, what, you told me it was seven, it's not seven bowstrings. Why did you lie to me? I can't believe you lied to me. Tell me the secret to your strength. 
He says, okay, okay, I'll tell you. If you take a brand new rope, it couldn't have been used on anything else, a brand new rope, and you tie me up, I won't be able to break it. I'll be as weak as any other man. So that night, what does she do? They tie him up with a brand new rope. She says, the Philistines are here. He wakes up, he snaps the rope, and he chases them off. Again. She's upset at him. It's like, Samson, you, you told me, you would, you'd tell me, what's the secret? He says, I don't know where he came up with this one. He's like, if you take my hair and you weave it into the loom, into fabric, then I'll be as weak as any man. So how she did this, I don't know, but she got a loom and she wove his hair into fabric. And she's like, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up and he rips his hair out and he goes and he chases them off. And, and again, she's upset. Listen to what it says in Judges 16, verse 15. Then Delilah pouted. I don't know if you ever experienced that before, but... Um, we won't, we won't ask you to raise your hands. This is a lie pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you won't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. Verse 16. So she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Now, this has always bothered me. What did he think was going to happen? I mean, he's told her three different things, and each time, what happened? She tried them. So it's like, don't you get it, Samson? She's actually going to try this to you. But regardless, he tells her. She, She kind of, you know, woos him to sleep. He goes to sleep. She brings in somebody, and they shaved his head. Pulled all that hair off. Let's see if this actually does it. Listen to Judges 16, verse 20 now. She cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and did what? Gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. What did he say before? I've used this jawbone of a donkey to make donkeys out of you, and now what's he doing? He's doing the job of a donkey, grinding out that grain, pushing on that grain. His eyes have been gouged out. Man, imagine the, the regret you'd feel. Like, you know what, if I just hadn't told her, but it's too late now. His strength is gone. <clears throat> and I write this down. Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He did it one step at a time. And this is the same way that our lives get ruined. It, it usually doesn't happen all at once with one big thing. It usually happens one step at a time. You're like, well, yeah, but there was this big thing. Yeah, but that big thing didn't just happen. It happened one step at a time. And here, Scripture says it's his strength left him. How many of us do we disobey God? And we, we try to battle these things with our own strength and we forget to tap into the power of God. We ignore what gives us our real strength and we try to just rely on our own. See, Samson made this assumption that his disobedience would never cost him anything. He's like, I can keep disobeying. I can do whatever I want. I can drink. I can, I can touch dead animals. I can even cut my hair. I can do whatever I want, and there will be no consequences. And we think that way sometimes, too, that we can do whatever we want, and it won't cost us anything. My question to you is, where have you been stepping away? Where have you been stepping away to what, from what God has called you to do? What... What razor has the enemy used on you to cut your hair, to take away your strength? Is it the razor of of pride, the razor of of, of lust, the the razor of, of, uh, of anger, the razor of jealousy, of envy, the razor of apathy, the razor of selfishness, perhaps? What razor has, has the enemy used on you to take away your strength? Maybe you, you don't take time reading your Bible as you once did, or maybe you don't take time in prayer, or maybe anger 
gets the best of you. You know, sometimes guys wear anger like it's a badge. You know, like, oh yeah, I get angry all the time. That's not something to be proud of. Maybe anger has gotten the best of you. Maybe pride, apathy, all of these things. Greed. So my challenge to you is to be honest about it. To step up and say, I'm going to be honest about these things. And I'm going to stop taking those steps away. Because it's just a little step. It's just a little step. It's just a little step. But before long, we're so far away that we don't even realize where we started from. So if that's you, if you're stepping away from God, what should you do? Very simple. Turn around. Turn around. If you're stepping away from God, turn around. I love this next verse. Judges 16.22. What's it say? Before long, what happened? His hair began to grow back. His hair began to grow back. Why is that verse there? I think that verse is there because God is saying, even though you sinned, even though you disobeyed me, even though you did everything I told you not to do, my grace is so much for you. I love you so much. This is how good my grace is, my mercy is, that even though you disobeyed, that what gives you strength will grow again. The thing that brings you strength, yeah, you're going to have some discipline for now, but it's not over yet. And he has a final battle. What's his final battle? He goes and he's grinding the grain. And they have this Colosseum where they, where they get together and they worship the god of Dagon. It's, it's a god with a man's head and the body of a fish. I'm not sure why you'd want to worship that, but they did. So they're like, they're all getting together. Like, yeah, Dagon and whatever. And they're having this big party. And there was probably 3,000 people there at this party. And, and they're all starting to get drunk. And they're saying, yeah, Dagon, like, let's bring out our enemy. Let's bring in Samson to entertain us. So they bring in Samson and he comes in to the arena. And they're looking at him. And he's weak. His eyes have been gouged out. His strength has been drained from him. But you know what? Write this down. Our enemy loves to make strong men weak, but our God loves to make weak men strong. Listen to what he says in Judges 16, 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again, O God. Please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. So he asked the boy, to put my, put my hands on the pillars that are supporting temple so I can rest. And and Scripture says that he began to push and his strength came back to him and he pushed and he pushed and the pillars fell over and the Colosseum began to collapse. And that one day, in that one act, even in giving his own life, he was able to kill more of the Philistines than he had his entire life, over 3,000 at that time. Because God gave him back his strength. Speaking of bad jokes, who's the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson, because he brought the house down. Anyhow, <laughs> I know, that's horrible, that's horrible. But um, Bible jokes, you got to love them. Um, here's the thing, though. What Samson did was easy. I mean, not to push in the, the, the columns down. But, you know, every, every guy, and, and probably every lady as well, has this unawakened hero inside of them. You hear a noise in the house at night and you get up and you're like, you know what? I, I'm willing to die for my family. I'm willing to go and take a bullet to save those that are dear to me. I love them. And that's great. Samson was willing to die to, to make a statement here also. But that's easy. A lot of us are willing to die for those that we care about. Samson gave his life one time, but real men, Give their life daily. Give their life daily to their wives, their kids, their parents. doesn't matter how old you are. doesn't matter if you're, you're a, a man or a woman. We can give our lives daily to those that matter. We can give our lives daily to God our Father who loves us so much, who's the one that gives us strength. In our weakness, He is made strong. So let's seek that strength. Man, have you been taking steps away? You say, you know, it's okay 
if I look at this, it's okay if I watch this, it's okay if I talk to this person, it's okay if I, if I you know, cheat on this paper a little bit, it's okay if I do this or that, it's okay if I, if I stretch the rules a little bit, my disobedience won't cost me anything. I would encourage you to turn around. Take that step. Turn around. And go back to where you're in the center of God's blessing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are our Father. You are a good Father. And no matter what anyone's experience is here with their earthly Father, I know some have have maybe never had a father. Maybe some of them, their father figure was, was, had a lot to be desired. But we know that you are a good father who loves us and gives us strength. And even when our hair has been cut and our strength has been drained away, that you cause our hair to grow again. You give us a second chance, that you love us. Maybe you're here and and you've never made a commitment, a personal commitment to follow Jesus as your Lord. And if so, this is a great opportunity to do that. To put Him first in your life. To say, I choose to follow Jesus. I'm going to take that step of faith right now. If that's where you are. And Scripture says that believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead and you confess this with your mouth that you are saved and I would encourage you to confess that to him now saying I believe you're my Lord I believe God rose you from the grave make that commitment to follow him Father we give you our lives you've given us so much You've been a father to us. You've been a guide. You've been a healer. You've been someone that brings restoration in our life. And we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, help us not to fall into these traps that Samson did. The lust and the pride and the anger. Although, I know that we've all done that before. Help us to turn back to you to confess those things. You know, when we talk about these things, confession is really a big part of this. And if you don't have a person in your life that you can talk honestly about, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a a, a sibling or a parent, maybe it's just a really good friend that you can just talk openly with, I would encourage you to find somebody. Begin, Begin pursuing a relationship like that that you can say, hey, you know what? I was on the internet and I looked at things I shouldn't have looked at. Or, or you know what? I, I, just, I did something the other day and I realized that I was acting out of pride. Or I got angry at something and I really shouldn't have. And I blew up and I shouldn't have. Somebody that you can confess that to. Because that's where real healing.